If you're going to be like David today, if you're going to recognize that Jesus is the King who can give you royal grace, then you're going to have to omit your sins. He was the King that Israel longed to wait for. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7 real quickly. 2, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verses 12 through 16 is the prophecy about this Davidic king. And God is making a covenant with David. And in this covenant he says, When your days, in verse 12 of chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits inequity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Now we know that Solomon, David's son, is mentioned here, but also when we consider the everlasting nature of God's kingdom, it was given to Jesus Christ. And it was a Jewish idea that they were looking for this Davidic king, this idea of a king who would establish, and many of them thought it would be a political kingdom, not just a spiritual kingdom. You see, Jesus, because He is the king of His kingdom, because Jesus is the dispenser of royal grace, he is the fulfiller of this everlasting kingdom. And it was made to a people of Israel so that Israel would be a blessing to the entire world. He's also called the son of Abraham. As you look back in Matthew, chapter Matthew, he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. The Bible says that when he made the Abrahamic covenant, he, he was promised uh, a, a seed and and the, all the families of the earth, it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, will be blessed. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, the Lord said, Your seed, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that seed was namely Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3.16, now the promises that were spoken to Abraham and his seed, he does not say, and to seeds, referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. When God made a promise to Abraham and to Israel, He was making it to the person also of His Son, namely Jesus Christ. And all of the Abrahamic blessings, all of the benefits, all of the privileges that were made to Abraham are found today in the Lord Jesus Christ. But He still made the blessing or made a king over Israel. We could go on and we could look at Isaac. We could look at Jacob. If you remember, Isaac was offered where? On the altar by Abraham, wasn't he? As a picture of what Jesus Christ would do for his people. You remember Judah and Jacob. Jacob was the deceiver. He had to wrestle with God. Judah uh, was the it was it was in the line of Jesus and had twelve sons who became the twelve tribes of Israel. And so Jesus in the line of, of, of a Jewish person, they would see him an important part of their kingship. But Jesus is not just a king over a physical nation, he's also a king over sinners. Look, look, look at some of the, the, the people that are mentioned in here. Look at verse 3. 
He says, and Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Let me stop there. Do you, do you know who Tamar is? In this genealogy, she was a woman. They wouldn't list women in their genealogies. This is, this is counterintuitive. It, it, this would be like going to... Um, let's see. Go, going to uh, McDonald's and ordering a steak dinner. This would be, this would be weird. This would be like, this doesn't happen, this can't happen, but Tamar is mentioned here because the, the father of Perez, and, the, and uh, the mom of Perez, and the mom of Zerah was Tamar, who was Judah's concubine or prostitute. Remember, she had married Oman, or Er, and his, and her brother, and her, his brother Onan, and eventually, Judah had promised his youngest son to Tamar, which he reneged on, and she became upset, dressed herself up in Genesis chapter 38 as a prostitute. And what happened was then they had offsprings together. And so in the lineage of Jesus, you see that Tamar and Judah, even though they're mentioned as, or at least Judah's mentioned as the, as the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, he was just as much a sinner as anybody else. These are not people who have a special halo above their head saying that they're special people because they are sinless or any such way. You didn't become part of the lineage of Jesus because you were special in any such way in your own self. You became part of the lineage of Jesus because of God's plan and because of God's grace that He offered to people and to a nation and to the world. Look at verse 5. You see the name, you see the name Rahab? Rahab, and she, she pulled no punches, and here's another lady. In a Jewish culture, this was unusual, and so Jesus was saying, hey, even the unusual and all of this stuff, Jesus is the mess messianic line because they're just not made up of people that are just good. They're made up of people that needed the mercy and grace of God. And it ends up with Mary, and did Mary need the mercy and grace of God? Absolutely. She was a sinner like you and me. She had no power or no majesty or no magic in her to be a, anything more special than anybody else. She was a human being just like you and me that was overshadowed by the Spirit of God who miraculously conceived our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But Rahab was, was a prostitute. But she believed in God in some ways because she believed in it and she saved the spies that went forth into the nation or the land of Canaan. You see, Jesus has a kingdom. It's the kingdom of our Lord. And it's the kingdom of royal grace. Only a king could give grace. When, when, a, when a nation or a kingdom says this is right and this is wrong, only the nation or the kingdom has the right to dispense grace and to, you know, like at the last part of any president's term, what do they do? They give clemency, don't they? They, they, they release people from their charges. Is it clemency or is it pardon? That's right, pardon. And only the officer in charge can give pardons. In Jesus' kingdom, it is Him. Jesus gave pardons to people in the world that the Jewish um, legalists and the Jewish Pharisees and the Jewish Sadducees says, you can't do that. But Matthew is saying, hey, He can because He's the King. He's the king. He can give mercy to Rahab. He can give mercy to Tamar. He can give mercy to Judah. He can give mercy to Abraham. He can give mercy to Mary. He can give mercy to David who had sinned with Bathsheba. All of these people were sinners. Just like you and me. 
And the greatest thing about this is, and the greatest thing about the story of Matthew and the story of the gospel is that it, it, it's not dependent upon our goodness or our greatness or our works, but it's dependent upon the lawgiver who extends mercy to his subjects. God is king over Israel. God is king over sinners. I could go on with this. God is king over Gentiles. Rahab was a Gentile. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 2 it says, When the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. The Jewish people were supposed to do what with Gentiles in the land of Canaan? What were they supposed to do to the Canaanites? Wipe them out, right? They weren't supposed to live with them or with their gods or anything, but they didn't obey completely. And here in the line of Jesus is Rahab. A Gentile. We heard a couple of weeks ago or a month ago about Ruth, a Moabitess, right? She was a Gentile. And it goes to show you that the gospel is not just physically centered. It is, it is worldwide. Even in the line of Jesus Christ, there are Gentiles and Jews. God, from the beginning of time, through the nation of Israel, was expanding His kingdom, not just to, the Gen to, to Jewish people culturally and physically, but He was expanding His kingdom worldwide through all peoples of all nations. Just as it says here through Ruth the Moabitess and through Rahab the, the harlot. One great passage that I, I come to when, when people tend to think that they deserve something from God based upon their, their origins... None of us should think we deserve anything from God because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But in John chapter 31, I'm just going to read this. You can turn to it if you would like to. But John, John says this as well as anybody else. He's talking, it says in verse 31, to, Jew, to Jesus. He says, so Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this was a Jewish mindset. They would say, we are offspring of Abraham and never been enslaved to anybody. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place into you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Now he's talking to Jews. He's talking to people who should have recognized that the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham was not a physical promise, but was a spiritual promise, and they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. In verse 39, and they answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to him, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You can go on. He talks about them becoming the, the, the offspring of the devil, the children of devils. 